Well, uh, thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here. And thanks for inviting me and organizing this uh, uh, wonderful workshop. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, this works. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm in part inspired by the excellent talk this morning by Professor Koivas on thermal radiation and uh, would like to follow uh, on his talk and continue to talk about uh, using nanophotonic structure to control thermal radiation. Uh, but uh, as uh, uh, complementing to what he has talked about, uh, I will be talk mostly about the control of far field thermal radiation. So uh, since this is sort of a tutorial, uh, I have also uh, sort of a lecture note associated with the talk that I'm giving here. And uh, in fact, the talk that I'm going to be giving uh, will follow very closely to this very short uh, review article that I wrote last year. So um, uh, as a background, certainly uh, thermal radiation is a ubiquitous uh, aspect of nature. Uh, every one of us, or every object that we see, uh, emits and receives thermal radiation. So uh, therefore, if you can control thermal radiation, uh, you are controlling the, a fundamental aspect of nature. And that's therefore of uh, both fundamental and practical importance. Uh, now, uh, if you open a textbook uh, on thermal radiation, uh, they tell you, uh, they basically tell you thermal radiation in terms of black body radiation. Uh, but you can probably infer a lot about uh, what the black body radiation law uh, would look like by looking at uh, one of the most uh, typical thermal radiators. This is a tungsten light bulb. Uh, you see, for example, uh, when you heat it up, uh, the color of it is white. And therefore, it gives rise to a broadband thermal radiation. You can see that from every angle. And so I have a wide angular range. And the total power is constrained by something called uh, Stefan Boltzmann law that was talked about this morning. And also, the absorption and emission uh, of these systems, of typical thermal radiative system, are constrained by something called the Kirchhoff law. One of the uh, interesting points uh, in thinking about nanophotonic structure uh, is that when you think about uh, structures where one of the, at least one of the features are comparable to thermal wavelengths, then the thermal radiated properties are drastically different from what the textbook examples would describe for you. And in fact, uh, one can argue that every single aspect of this can be changed. And so uh, that forms the outline of the first part of my talk. Uh, I'm going to basically go through uh, some of the most prominent properties of black body thermal radiation law and argue that you can use nanophotonic engineering to change that. Then uh, in the second part of my talk, uh, I'm going to give just one particular application uh, of doing so in energy technology. And that's something we've been interested in for a while, and that's something called radiative cooling. So uh, let me start with the first part, uh, controlling the, uh, and I'll start by talking about controlling the spectral property. So uh, as I mentioned, standard black body radiator or thermal radiator has uh, broadband uh, radiation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, with a nanophotonic control, you can actually design a spectrum of thermal radiation that are drastically different from the black body thermal radiative law. And this is a relatively simple concept and come out of what's called the Kirchhoff law of detail balance. What the Kirchhoff law says is that the absorptivity of a structure for light that's coming in at a frequency omega and the coming in at a particular angle of instant theta is equal to the emissivity of an emitter at the same frequency omega and back at the same angle of emission theta. So this is a time reversal pair uh, between each other. So the absorptivity is equal to the emissivity. Consequently, if you would like to design thermal emitter with unusual emissivity properties, all you need to do is to try to come up with structures where it has unusual absorptivities. And uh, in nanophotonics, it's not too hard to imagine that you can put in a wavelength scale structure to generate absorption spectrum that are drastically different from a black body. So consequently, there has been uh, actually a very large body of work using a wide variety of nanophotonic structure to control thermal emissivity. And you can generate, for example, broadband thermal emission has a cutoff, or you can generate very narrow band uh, thermal uh, emissivity uh, spectrum. 
Now, uh, one of the practical motivation of trying to control the thermal emissivity as such uh, come from actually solar energy conversion. Uh, one of the basic difficulty of solar energy conversion come from the fact that the solar spectrum was actually very broad. The sun is a black body radiator. Now, when you send a sunlight that has broad spectrum into a PN junction solar cell, the photon that has energy below the band gap, of course, cannot generate electron hole pair. Those are wasted. The photons that are above the band gap will generate electron hole pair, but the electron hole pair can only have energy that's comparable to the band gap energy. So a significant part of the photon energy actually has been wasted in this case as heat. So uh, in this regard, uh, and that limits basically, for example, uh, even in full concentrated case of single junction cell uh, to an efficiency of about 40%. So uh, from this perspective, uh, one of the interesting ideas from optics perspective is that if you want to enhance the solar energy conversion efficiency, then you should actually try to go engineer the sun. Because it really, sun is really not very good as far as uh, solar energy uh, conversion is concerned. So, and that gave rise to this idea called thermal photovoltaics, which really uh, is an idea that trying to engineer the spectrum that's instant upon the solar cell. So the idea here uh, is actually to take the same single junction cell and of course the same sun because that's not something you can change but you put something in between and what the something that you put in between on one side of it that's facing the sun will have a broadband absorption so you absorb the entire solar spectrum and then heat it up. On the other side of it, the side that's facing the solar cell would generate a narrow band thermal radiation. And in doing so, uh, what it effectively does is it take a broad band solar spectrum and compress all the energy into a narrow spectral band. And once you do that, you can actually drastically enhance the solar cell efficiency. Uh, in fact, the theoretical analysis of this uh, indicates that for the same sun and the same single junction PN, uh, single uh, junction uh, solar cell, uh, you could actually double the theoretical efficiency to be about 85%. And so that really has motivated uh, a lot of effort in trying to design, for example, narrow band thermal radiator and in trying to control uh, the emission coming out of a thermal radiator. So, uh, since this is a tutorial, uh, one of the perhaps the simplest way uh, to imagine how you would go design a narrowband thermal radiator uh, can be thought of just from a very simple couple mode theory model. So if you imagine that you have a single resonator and that's backed by a mirror so that it will leak out only towards the direction of incidence. Then a resonator like that has two important rates, the external leakage rate coming out of the outgoing radiation as well as the intrinsic loss rate of the resonator. And it is well known that there is what's called a critical coupling condition when the external leakage rate is equal to the intrinsic loss rate, then you will have absorptivity at the resonant frequency that goes to unity. And so consequently by the Kirchhoff law, you would at that narrow range of frequency have a unity emissivity and therefore you have a narrow emissivity spectrum. So uh, one interesting aspect as an application of this is that even if you start with a material such as tungsten which are fairly lossy and uh, generally give you a broadband thermal radiative spectrum, uh, it is in fact starting from that you can actually create a thermal emitter with an arbitrarily narrow line width. And the idea is as follows, so you take a piece of tungsten which is fairly lossy and you put on top of it a transparent dielectric layer and for example silicon carbide in the near infrared range is fairly lossless and then you basically put a grating on the silicon carbide. Now uh, in doing so you create what's called a guided resonance in the silicon carbide layer because this is a high index material and this guided resonance uh, its external leakage rate is controlled by the grating and its absorption rate it comes from the fact that the evanescent tail of the guided resonance sees the lossy tungsten layer. So consequently uh, 
uh, if you need to design a, a narrow band thermal radiator, what you can do is you choose the gap size here between the carbide layer and the tungsten layer to be such so that its intrinsic loss rate gives you the line width that you want. And once you do that, you then design the parameter of the grating, for example, the edge depth of the grating. And that will basically give you uh, a matching between the external leakage rate and internal loss rate. So in doing so, you can start with a, a bulk tungsten layer, which has emissivity spectrum that look like the red curve here, and generate a emissivity peak that reach unity over narrow bandwidth. And moreover, the width here of this narrow peak can be arbitrarily chosen by simply playing with this kind of critical coupling condition. And that's a capability that's actually quite useful if you need to go design this uh, for thermal uh, photovoltaic systems. So uh, now closely related to the control of the spectral property of the emission uh, is the capability to control the angular properties. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, pioneering work, this is John Jack Griffith's work, uh, in uh, designing novel thermal radiator uh, consists precisely of trying to control angular emission uh, ca characteristic. He would take a uh, silicon carbide and then put a, a micron scale grating there and sees that depending on the wavelengths, the thermal emission coming out of silicon carbide grating can be highly angular as indicated by the curves here. And uh, from a resonance picture, actually this is very easily understood. Uh, for this structure, you have the guided resonance band structure. In this case, I rotate the band structure by 90 degrees, so I'm plating energy as a function of angle and therefore the wave vector. And in doing so, you have these bands. So at a particular frequency, uh, these resonance basically will give you a very sharp angular emission coming out of uh, these structures. So uh, the, uh, using resonance, you could actually get strong control over both the angular and spectral characteristic of the thermal emission. Now, let me now move on to the third topic about some of the fundamental aspect of the control of thermal radiation. Uh, this is very closely related to uh, what Professor Koivas talked about this morning uh, in trying to uh, create uh, what's called a super Planckian thermal emitter. Uh, but let me give a, a sort of a background. So a textbook example of a black body radiator consists basically of a big vacuum box with a small opening and also a weak absorber that is at the wall of this box. These are all macroscopic. They are not micro cavity at all. Uh, now, in this case, this is a black body because every ray that's coming in, passing through this opening, will bounce back and forth many times and therefore eventually get absorbed and will never come out. And therefore, the thing look black. So uh, consequently, if you heat this up to a temperature, then the emission of this body is described uh, by the Stefan Boltzmann law, uh, where everything here, the sigma here, is related to fundamental constants, and A here is the opening of this aperture. One of the uh, important characteristics of the Stefan Boltzmann law is that, in fact, uh, it's very difficult to construct a macroscopic body that will emission that goes beyond the uh, Stefan Boltzmann law. So uh, here is an illustration. Uh, you can imagine, for example, that the internal density of state inside this big cavity is related to the refractive index of the material inside the cavity. So consequently, uh, instead of using air inside, if you use a high index material with an uh, index n, then the thermal flux inside the cavity due to the density of state argument will be enhanced by a factor of n squared. So consequently, if you put a high index material inside the cavity, you would have more thermal radiation energy inside the cavity. This n squared factor, however, is exactly balanced out by the total internal reflection that occur 
at the uh, interface between the high index material and the air outside. The size of the escape cone also scale as 1 over n square, which exactly cancels this factor. So consequently, in fact, it is quite well known that for macroscopic emitter, uh, not the kind that Professor Quiver has talked about this morning, uh, uh, in practice, nothing emits more than a black body radiator. Now, knowing this, however, you see that one of the basic points here is that you have an emitter that's directly emitting into far field vacuum with nothing in between. So uh, consequently, in that case, as I have shown here, uh, you will never get an emission for macroscopic body that go beyond the uh, Stefan Boltzmann law. On the other hand, knowing this, uh, you can imagine what we call a thermal extraction scheme. In this case, you keep the same emitter without change and it's emitting to the same far field vacuum. But what you do is you put a transparent medium on top of the emitter. And the transparent medium by itself, these are transparent so it's not lossy at all, does not generate any thermal radiation. However, when you put this thing on top of it, and if the area of the transparent medium is large enough, then effectively you can actually extract all the electromagnetic thermal energy in the emitter to the far field vacuum. So in doing so, you can take a macroscopic emitter by itself and significantly enhance its total emission power to the far field. And uh, geometrical argument, the geometrical optical argument is a very simple one. So imagine you take this system uh, where a cavity that's filled with a high refractive index N. Now uh, instead of directly emitting into air, you put a semi-spherical dome on top of it with a matching index but lossless. In this case, there's no internal reflow to internal refraction at this interface, so every ray is going to come out. Now if you put the storm to be large enough, then every ray that's coming out when it hits the outer boundary here is going to hit it along the normal direction. So there's again no total internal reflection and all these rays were able to come out. So in doing so, the same emitter when radiating to far field actually acquire an extra factor of n square in its total emission power. And uh, this is something that we actually seen experimentally. So uh, in experiment, we will have a, uh, as a meter, we would basically use about a millimeter size uh, of uh, a, a, a black carbon and put on aluminum substrate. And this will have a massivity of 85%. So it's a pretty good proxy to a thermal uh, black body emitter. And uh, uh, to extract all the thermal energy out, uh, we will put a, uh, a semi-spherical dome, in this case a zinc selenide dome, on top of the black emitter. Uh, and we check that the dome itself uh, does not emit, at least in the mid -wave, uh, mid infrared wavelengths, because zinc selenide is transparent in those wavelengths range. And uh, then uh, in the experiment, uh, what we do is we basically uh, compare these two cases. So the black dots here uh, is the carbon black emitter. And the yellowish looking thing is the zinc selenide uh, semi-spherical dome that we put on top of it. And what you see is the uh, blue curve here is the bare carbon. So it has a spectrum that's very black body like. And it has a massivity of 85%, so it's slightly below the theoretical black body curve. And in contrast, when you put a semi-spherical dome on top of it, you are going to see a uh, thermal emission that actually exceeds the black body of the same area over basically every single wavelength. And uh, physically, uh, this is actually a way to enhance the electromagnetic absorption cross-section of a macroscopic object. So uh, this can be seen by the experiment where we simply take an infrared camera and just look at the emitter while it's emitting. So uh, as you can see, uh, the area of the uh, black dots will light up. And if you go to a larger angle, then you basically see the projection of these dots so the area will become smaller. Now for the same system, if you put a semi-spherical dome on top of it, 
what you see is that the emitting area is a lot larger and it remains large over a very large range of angles. So you give basically all angle enhancement of the electromagnetic cross section. Even though this is entirely a macroscopic effect, the emitter here is millimeter in size, the physics here is a near field physics. The emitter actually need to be in the uh, electromagnetic near field of the transparent medium so that all the rays can come out. And uh, in fact, uh, if we put a air gap between the emitter and the transparent medium and if the size of that gap is larger than 10 micron, then you get this picture. At normal direction, you again see a larger emitting area, but that comes simply from a refocusing effect. When you move to larger angle, you can see the emitter basically disappears and that is an indication that in this case you don't have the enhancement of the cross-section over a large area. All you have is a refocusing of light and in doing so therefore you have the total emission power that also fall below the black body. And uh, this is potentially interesting uh, because it potentially provide a way to take a emitter, for example, that you can use in a thermal photovoltaic system and significantly enhance the amount of power that you can get out of these kind of emitters. So uh, in the last part of my talk about the fundamental aspect, I'm going to comment on the uh, Kirchhoff law and talk about the potential of non-reciprocal uh, thermal emitters. So I mentioned this already, that the Kirchhoff law where you have a balance between absorptivity and emissivity at a frequency by frequency and angle by angle fashion. Now, uh, the Kirchhoff law being a fundamental law has a very significant practical implication and this is again coming out of solar energy conversion. So uh, in solar energy conversion, of course, we're trying to design something that very significantly absorbs sunlight. Now, by Kirchhoff law, therefore, if you have an efficient absorber, it's going to emit. And uh, moreover, if it efficiently absorbs light that coming from the sun, it's going to be able to efficiently emit back to the sun. Whatever photon that you emit back to the sun, of course, doesn't do you any good as far as solar energy conversion is concerned. So consequently, uh, it would be a lot nicer in solar energy conversion if you can imagine uh, solar cells that will efficiently absorb from the sun, but when it radiates out, it doesn't radiate back to the sun, but instead radiate elsewhere. In doing so then, you can uh, put another solar cell, for example, to get a second chance of the energy that was in the re-emission. In fact, it is known that the thermodynamic limit of solar energy conversion can only be reached if you have such a non-reciprocal thermal emitter. The difference between the, uh, the reciprocal limit and the ultimate limit uh, is the difference between about 86% to 93% of the solar energy conversion efficiency. So uh, there is actually substantial gain that can be had if one can have significant uh, capability of breaking the symmetry between absorptivity and emissivity. Now, uh, even though not many textbooks emphasize this point, uh, it is important for this purpose and I'm going to try to give you an example that this Kirchhoff law or detailed balance is in fact not a requirement of the second law. And uh, uh, in fact, this comes about entirely from the fact that the emitter is made of reciprocal material, meaning that its dielectric function is a symmetric tensor or scalar for that purpose. Um, so now, the vast majority of the thermal emitter that you see are made of uh, reciprocal materials. And uh, any time that you can write the dielectric function of a material in terms of a single complex number, 
you know that it is a reciprocal material, basically. So uh, without doing anything, if I look at our early experiment and I can take a look at all the materials that I use there, I know that this is a reciprocal system because every one of this is described basically by scalar dielectric function. Uh, and one of the important consequences when you think about a reciprocal system uh, is uh, you can describe them in terms of what's called a scattering matrix. These are matrix that relate the outgoing amplitude to the incoming wave amplitude. So are they typically just a reflection and transmission coefficient? The reciprocity theorem uh, then imply that this matrix here is symmetric, which means that the mode-to-mode -mode transmission coefficient on both directions tend to be equal to each other in both amplitude and phase. So it's a very strong constraint. Uh, now, on the other hand, there has been material system like the magneto-optical material, where if you look at its dielectric tensor, you will actually be asymmetric. These are material that fundamentally should break the reciprocity, and therefore, these materials will have very interesting thermodynamic properties that are different as compared to standard optical materials. So uh, to highlight the thermodynamic consequence of having magneto-optical material, uh, it is actually fairly straightforward to design, if you have a non-reciprocal system that's lossy, to design a system that's essentially planar so that if light come in, then you can look at two pathways, a plane wave coming in and reflect it, and it's time reverse pathway where you send the light backward and then you reflect it this way. And you can look at these two reflection coefficients. If the system will reciprocal, these two will be equal in both amplitude and phase. But if you do magneto-optical material and structure design, uh, it's very natural to come up with systems where these two reflection coefficients actually can differ from each other in terms of amplitude. That actually has important thermodynamic consequences. So as illustration, what you can do is hypothetically, as the, in a in thought experiment, you take these emitter and then couple them to two black body, we'll call A and B, to capture these two pathways of the reflection from A to B and B to A. And then you will set all these objects at the same temperature T. When you do that, the second law of thermodynamics will say that the energy influx in each of the objects, the net energy influx in each of the object has to be zero. And that will give you, therefore, a set of constraints. For example, if you focus on black body A here, it's a black body, so it has unity emissivity, that is the energy outflow. And in terms of the energy inflow, it's going to take the energy from the non-reciprocal emitter, so it's this process here, as well as the reflection of light from B here, bounce back the non-reciprocal emitter and emits into A. So you get an equation basically that says the emissivity of the non-reciprocal emitter along A uh, plus the reflectivity from B to A has to be equal to unity. And you can derive a similar equation for each of these objects that I show here. And that's a very simple set of equations. Once you have done that, then with one line of algebra, you can show that in this case, the difference between the emissivity and the absorptivity along this direction actually is equal to the reflectivity differences between these two pathways. So what you commonly see in the design of magneto-optical material having an asymmetric S matrix, scattering matrix, in terms of example these two reflectivity from two reciprocal pathways being different directly translate into a violation of the Kirchhoff law. Now, having discussed the possibility of violating the Kirchhoff law, we come back to the practical example that we're trying to do. Uh, in this case, uh, what you would like is to be able to reroute the emission somewhere else, not going back to the sun. So from a practical point of view, what you would like is to maximally violate detail balance. In other words, you really would like to essentially have near unity emission elsewhere, 
but near unity absorption coming from this direction. And this is something that uh, requires a bit of uh, design. So uh, here is the structure. We take uh, n-type Indian arsenide uh, uh, sitting on the mirror, apply a magnetic field uh, in a heavily doped uh, narrow band gap material. Uh, is the electric tensor will have a strong uh, Joule component. In the present magnetic field, you will have an off-diagonal matrix element that breaks the reciprocity. So uh, for this system, uh, if you compute the absorptivity and the emissivity spectrum for these two reciprocal pathways, you will get frequencies where you will have essentially complete violation that you will have near zero absorptivity, for example, in some wavelengths, whereas uh, complete uh, emissivity in the same wavelengths. So that's at least a step towards uh, thinking about designing the system eventually for energy applications. Uh, by the way, the uh, emissivity calculation here uh, is done exactly using the uh, uh, fluctuational uh, electrodynamic formula sum that the Professor Cuevas talked about this morning because you can no longer, of course, in this case, infer emissivity from absorptivity calculation. So, uh, having shown you the design of at least one nanophotonic emitter that can completely violate Kirchhoff's law, uh, one of the interesting questions is, well, how does one generalize the Kirchhoff law without the constraint of reciprocity? So, if you want to look at outside reciprocal material, what kind of law can you have that can be used to generalize and replace the Kirchhoff law? So uh, for this paper, for this purpose, again, we can come back to look at the scattering matrix of the system. So that's a scattering matrix that defines the input, relates the input amplitude to the output amplitude. For reciprocal system, it is symmetric. For non-reciprocal system, of course, it's not. So uh, once you do that, you can show uh, that the, if you have a particular incident rate, then the absorptivity for that instant state can be mathematically written in this way. And you can see it's the violation of a unitarity of the scattering matrix that gives you the absorption. And similarly, if you want to look at the emissivity to a particular output state, you can also analogously define an output operator. And the emissivity is simply the expectation value of the output operator on this output state. Now, from this, you can then derive the Kirchhoff law when the uh, scattering matrix is symmetric. Then you can show that if the outgoing wave is the time reversal of the incoming state, then the absorptivity and the emissivity will be equal. And this is exactly the form uh, of the Kirchhoff law that you would typically know. On the other hand, for the non-reciprocal system, for any incoming absorption state, you can in fact find an outgoing state that has the same emissivity as the absorptivity for the incoming state. And this can be constructed deterministically. What you do is you do a singular value decomposition of the scattering matrix. You expand the incoming state in terms of a linear superposition of these singular vectors, then you construct the outgoing state consists of a linear superposition when you send each of the principal uh, singular vector into the system and you look at how they're scattered and you sum them together, you will actually get an outgoing state that has the emissivity that's the same as the emissivity of uh, absorptivity of the incoming state. And in doing so, you generalize the Kirchhoff law by saying that for every incoming state with a particular absorptivity, you can always construct an outgoing state that has the same emissivity, except that outgoing state is no longer a time reversal of the incoming state. So uh, that concludes the uh, first part of my talk, uh, where I try to show you that, uh, in fact, you can do a lot. Uh, by uh, thinking about basic uh, thermodynamic properties of nanophotonic systems. Uh, 
in the second part of my talk, I'd like to uh, give you uh, one application. Obviously, controlling thermal radiation uh, has enormously wide range of possible applications. Uh, but I'd like to just give you one as I highlight some of our uh, more recent interest. And this is something called radiative cooling. So the idea here, uh, in a nutshell, is trying to harvest uh, the coldness of the universe. And uh, in basic thermodynamics, if you would like to have a high efficiency uh, energy conversion, then you know the Carnot efficiency limit, which says that you would like to have a high temperature heat source. Uh, for example, the sun at 6,000 Kelvin would be fantastic. On the other hand, you will also like to have a low temperature heat sink. Now, the vast majority of the energy conversion process use the Earth itself as the heat sink. On the other hand, if you simply sink outside the Earth, then you will immediately encounter something uh, that's much colder. And so if you can use this as a heat sink, you will have a possibility to impact a wide range of energy conversion processes that's going on on Earth. Now, uh, thermal radiation come in because it provides the access to this heat sink. Uh, the black curve here is the uh, transmission spectrum of the Earth's atmosphere. And the, black, the red curve here is the 300 Kelvin black body spectrum, which is where uh, roughly where everybody is. And uh, uh, you can see the peak of the 300 Kelvin black body spectrum. Actually, it's not an accident. It coincides with the transparency window of the atmosphere. This goes very significantly to why the temperature of the Earth is what it is, is the existence of this transparency window. So consequently, uh, any object, ourselves included, if you walk out right now, uh, you would be uh, emitting heat uh, into outer space. And therefore, uh, that's a cooling process. You would, in principle, uh, be doing cooling. And uh, this is known for many decades. Uh, there's a technology called nighttime radiated cooling. Uh, you take a black emitter, something black, yourself included. Uh, you go up to the roof, uh, but you surround yourself by a insulating material. And uh, this is a very simple experiment. You can easily show that the temperature of the emitter in that case will fall below ambient by about 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. Okay. So, uh, so Radiated cooling, in this sense, definitely works. Now, um, in order to uh, actually use this kind of cooling uh, idea, however, uh, if you want to do cooling, of course, you would like to do, do it when things are hot. And things are usually hotter during the day. So it would be a lot nicer if you can do radiated cooling uh, not just at night, but during the day. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you can. Um, if you walk out of this room right now, you'll be doing radiative cooling. So in principle, you should get, any, you should get colder. Uh, of course, that's hardly our everyday experience. And the argument is simply that the sun is heating you up. And so uh, usually, you don't get any colder at all. Now, uh, from that perspective, uh, it's very straightforward to imagine that you are going to design a nanophotonic structure that behave as a very good mirror for the solar radiation, so they reflect all the sunlight. But it has a strong emissivity in the 8 to 13 micron window, so it can emit the heat out. And uh, uh, in a theory paper uh, that we published in uh, 2013, uh, what we show is that you indeed can design, at least in principle, a nanophotonic structure that look like this, uh, which is essentially a mirror in the solar wavelength range, and it's black into 8 to 13 micron window. And what we predict is that this structure by itself, under the sun, can reach a temperature that's sub-freezing. In other words, without any electricity input, you put this thing on a roof, it's going to get to a temperature below the freezing point of water. And the cooling power of this exceeds 100 watt per meter square. So this is a theory paper uh, that we wrote uh, in 2013. I should say the field of nanophotonics is probably the kindest to theorists. Uh, so uh, every time you publish something that looks somewhat crazy, people were uh, very polite and they just smile. Uh, so it's very nice, I must say. Uh, in this case, though, uh, when we look carefully in our theory, we actually believe it. 
so uh, uh, we actually set out to do the experiment ourselves. Um, so the experiment uh, structure, experimental structure, is a uh, significant simplification from our initial theory prediction. Now we'll have only multi-layer film, so we have a silicon wafer, so an eight-inch silicon wafer. Uh, on top of it, we have a silver mirror, and on top of the silver mirror, we have seven dielectric layers. The uh, the top three layer, the, the, all these dielectric layers are made of silicon oxide and hafnium oxide, and the emission really comes from the phonon plyoton of the silicon oxide. We say hafnium oxide used there, but primarily to generate effectively uh, unity index material for impedance matching purposes. So it's actually a matter material design. Uh, so the top three layers here have thickness on the order of hundreds of nanometer, and these are for emission purposes, and you can see a fairly strong emission peak right at the transparency window uh, of the atmosphere. The lower four layers here have thicknesses on the order of tens of nanometer. And this together with the silver give you a broadband solar reflection over the entire solar spectrum. So if you average over AM 1.5 solar spectrum, you get a reflectivity of about 96 to 97 percent. And uh, we then put this thing uh, on the uh, roof of our uh, electrical uh, engineering building, which very nicely has a, a very flat roof for our experiment. Uh, it's actually one of the only building, I think, at Stanford campus uh, that has this characteristic. Most of our campus, unfortunately, look more like that. So we're very lucky in this case. And uh, when we put this on a roof, and this experiment carried out several years ago, uh, what you see is that this uh, radiated cooler will have a temperature that's five degrees Celsius below the ambient air temperature, uh, right at the peak of the sun when they're about 900 watt per meter square of solar uh, irradiance that's directly instant upon the structure. So uh, therefore, you can really do this kind of cooling uh, without any uh, electricity input. So uh, we also do a measurement of cooling power. And this is experiment where, given that the structure by itself has a temperature below the ambient air, you can then put a heat load on there. You can heat it up, and uh, uh, if you, uh, you can heat it up until it reaches back the temperature of the ambient. And uh, the amount of power that you need to put in to heat it back up to the ambient, then define what's called the cooling power. So in our uh, initial experiment, this is about, we got about 40 watt per meter square of experimentally of cooling power. Uh, the theoretical limit uh, is more than 100 watt per meter square. This, uh, the group in Colorado actually have, was able to demonstrate, and we're also very close in our later experiment of getting essentially very close to 100 watt per meter square. And uh, interesting enough, this is a number uh, that's order magnitude wise, uh, you should think about it uh, in terms of solar energy. Uh, the uh, solar cell gives you about 200 watt per meter square of electricity, uh, but can only do it for about six to seven hours usually when there's sun. In contrast, this kind of cooling power is available 24 hour a day, at least in principle. So, when you calculate this out, uh, it turned out to be a technology in terms of the magnitude of its potential comparable to solar energy, and which is remarkable because uh, uh, the solar energy scale is huge. So uh, we're talking about a technology that potentially has the similar potential as the solar energy that has hardly been uh, touched, which is kind of unusual. Now, uh, that was our initial experiment. Uh, it took a few years for other group to uh, try to replicate the experiment and do a better job than we did. Uh, so uh, I should mention this work from uh, the group in Colorado uh, was able to make, I think, was a silica microsphere in a polymer matrix and was able to demonstrate a pretty nice radiative cooling. Uh, the experiments that I like the most uh, is the work by uh, Nanfang Yu's group uh, in Columbia who went and find, uh, very cleverly, went and find this thing called silver ant that live in the desert and took its body and measured its spectrum. And it happens that this uh, little ant uh, has a pretty high uh, solar reflectivity uh, and also a pretty high thermal emissivity. The spectrum is almost reminiscent of what we have constructed. 
and they have concluded, of course the N can't tell you that, but they have concluded from the measurement uh, that the N is trying to do radiative cooling. Um, so uh, I, I guess in terms of conceptual novelty, uh, well, it's hard to compete. Uh, they certainly did it a few million years ago. Uh, that's a little bit hard to compete. But uh, on the other hand, if you look carefully in their spectrum, you could not get subambient cooling uh, out of their spectrum. So uh, we, uh, our engineering capability is slightly better. Uh, that's how I would have said it against the ants. But uh, okay, so uh, joking aside, uh, one of the questions that one should think about uh, in a technology like this is how do you actually use it? So uh, most of the modern building that you see, certainly the natural thing to think about the application of this uh, is to try to do air conditioning. Most of the modern buildings that we are in, on the other hand, are very well insulated. So if you do cooling on the roof and cool down the roof, you would do very little to influence the thermal footprint of the building. So what you would, not, what you would need instead is a way you are going to have to do this on the roof, but you have to deliver the coolness into the building. In other words, you would need to actually couple these kind of radiative cooling with standard air conditioning system that deliver the coldness inside. And so in a subsequent experiment, by the way, we also have a, a large scale fabrication of these cooler ourselves uh, with uh, can produce meter square worth of material. And then we put circulating water pipe underneath these panels so that we can cool the water temperature below the ambient air temperature by a couple degree, maybe two to three degrees Celsius. Then we can feed the water into a water cooled condenser. And in doing so, that few degree change of the water inlet temperature will lead to an improvement of system efficiency by more than 10%. So 15% uh, of US power consumption goes to air conditioning. And so this is something, if you can improve the uh, system efficiency at that level of 10% or so, it can potentially have a substantial impact. And so we have uh, really uh, Eli Goldstein, uh, one of my former postdocs, uh, and us uh, together have started a company called SkyCool and we're actually trying to put this right now uh, onto uh, some of the supermarket chain, uh, Whole Food, uh, to run a uh, whole year worth of experimental data uh, to really show how much electricity we can save. So we are uh, in many ways trying to, uh, in our own way, trying to push this into marketplace. Uh, from a fundamental side, uh, one of the questions that one can ask is, uh, well, we're doing cooling, so how cold can we get? Our exper initial experiment was about 5 degrees Celsius below ambient. On the other hand, at least theoretically you would say, well, we're trying to establish a thermal equilibrium uh, with outer space. And the outer space is 3 Kelvin. So therefore, in principle, uh, one should be able to do 3 Kelvin. Uh, so, uh, to be more precise, if you imagine that you have an uh, atmosphere that happened to be transparent, completely transparent in a particular wavelength range, then you can design a narrow band thermal emitter along the line that I talked about, right inside that transparency window. That object will only have uh, trying to establish thermal equilibrium with outer space if you cut down all the other parasitic then you will get 3 Kelvin. Now more realistically, uh, this blue curve here is the transmission spectrum uh, of the atmosphere at Stanford. It's pretty good. 90% or so is certainly not unity. And if you do the calculation, that's what we did in the 2013 paper, if you do the calculation for that kind of atmosphere, you will get a temperature that's about 40 to 60 degrees Celsius uh, below the ambient air temperature. Uh, in demonstrating this, you would need to cut down the parasitic. So uh, what we did is we uh, built a vacuum chamber to surround the radiator cooler and then again put this thing on top of our roof. And uh, uh, in that experiment, what we see is that you can get 40 degrees Celsius uh, below the ambient air temperature. Uh, this is data taken over a 36 hour uh, period. So uh, you get that both for day and night. And uh, this is way below the freezing point of water. 
And one thing that's potentially interesting about this uh, is for, for example, a small scale uh, food or medicine storage uh, in an off grid situation, then there's something that we're also uh, trying to pursue. In the last few minutes or so, um, uh, I like to uh, talk about uh, more generally about trying to control the thermal load of a color object. If you look at the radiated cooler that we have done, of course, it looks like a mirror. Now, um, uh, so uh, for example, if you have a car that's parked in a parking lot uh, in the summer and gets very hot, and you ask, well, what's the optimum? Uh, car should look like as far as keeping the car cool is concerned, then of course it should look like a mirror. Uh, but of course, uh, some people may prefer their car to look like this instead. Uh, the point here is that uh, in many situations, it would be very important to combine the radiated cooling with a utilization of the sunlight. The fact it looks like red says something about how you absorb the light. So in that regard, it would be important to understand for a given color what exactly is the thermal load either on the high end or low end that you can get given the environment that it is in. So uh, in doing so, you would need to think through both the solar and the radiative uh, 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 wavelengths range, so go all the way from, for example, about 300 nanometer all the way to be about 25 micron, right? And here there are a few important aspects that controls the radiative thermal load of a color object. Uh, we talk about radiative cooling, so depending on whether you have high emissivity or low emissivity here, you will have a cooling power vary from zero to be about 130 watt per meter square. Um, the other thing is the infrared solar absorption. And this is the part that doesn't, of course, contribute to visual experience. But there's substantial amount of solar power there. So again, depending on whether you design it to be reflecting, absorbing, you can have about 400 watt per meter square differences there. The last uh, uh, spectrum here is the visible spectrum. Now, it turned out there is an effect called uh, a metamerism, which is to say that the same color response that human eye have can actually have drastically different spectrum because, uh, well, we only have three photodetectors in our eye, so our eye is not exactly a photodetector. So uh, when you, what you see a yellow object can have drastically different solar spectrum and therefore have very different uh, solar absorption as well. So um, as a simple illustration of this metamerism uh, effect, uh, you can actually, it's a kind of interesting, that you can look at two yellow objects and uh, this is actually how their spectrum look like. Both actually generate yellow, but they look very different and one of them will have much higher solar absorption compared with the other. So uh, you can actually control thermal load this way as well. And in fact, uh, these two spectrum actually differ in their solar absorption by more than 200 watt per meter square. So if you combine all three effects here, in other words, uh, for the hot object, you try to absorb as much sunlight as possible while keeping the color the same. Uh, in the visible, you try to absorb all the sub, uh, uh, so the infrared uh, solar spectrum, and you try to not do any radiated cooling. As compared to a cold object, where you try to design it to absorb as little visible as possible while keeping the color the same, you don't absorb any infrared solar spectrum, and then you do maximum radiated cooling. And you compare these two things that both look yellow, the difference in their radiative thermal load is about 800 watt per meter square, which is actually huge. Um, as a point of reference, sunlight has about a kilowatt per meter square. So you are actually talking about essentially almost the entire solar uh, uh, power density kind of number. Okay. So uh, we have computed uh, 
in this paper every color that you can think of uh, uh, what the tunable range is and turned out for every color the tunable range is rather large the smallest one is about 600 watt per meter square the largest one is about 866 watt per meter square so you really for every color that you have you have actually a huge range in trying to control its radiative thermal load and to translate this into temperature, uh, you can assume a reasonable outdoor condition of what the convective and conductive heat transfer coefficient is. And uh, uh, for many of these color, for the same color, because the radiative thermal load is different, the temperature can differ by more than 70 degrees Celsius. So it's very large. And uh, in doing so, you can also get a fairly counterintuitive result. For example, you can design a white object that can be a lot hotter as compared to a black object, for example. So uh, as a way to show it, uh, here is an experiment. So uh, we constructed, uh, using multi-layer things, uh, two objects. Uh, both of them look uh, pinkish. Uh, but uh, they actually have different uh, visible spectrum and there you have a difference of 100 watt per meter square. Uh, one of them, the hot one, is designed to absorb significantly the infrared solar radiation whereas the other one is trying to absorb as little as possible. And finally, uh, the cold one will have a large thermal emissivity in the thermal wavelength range whereas the hot one will have little thermal emissivity. So, uh, when you look at it, this is experimentally, uh, you can have two pink objects that have a thermal load differ by almost 500 watt per meter square. And then uh, we go to our roof and do the uh, experiment. Uh, so um, the two pink objects under the sun has a temperature differ by 47.6 uh, Celsius. Okay. And uh, this is to compare with a pink, uh, pink paint that we get that happened to lie somewhere in the middle. So that's the range of pink that you can do. It's about 47 degree. And the other thing that's actually quite interesting uh, is that the hot object here, the hot pink, actually will have a temperature that's higher than a black paint that you get commercially by more than 10 degrees Celsius. So uh, remarkably, I think, uh, even though, of course, controlling thermal load of color object is well known uh, in the literature, uh, the fact that it has such a huge uh, temperature and also thermal load range has never been pointed out and demonstrated before. So we think this is actually quite exciting. So uh, with that, I think uh, I should stop. And let me uh, give a few summarizing remarks. Uh, the first point, I think, is from a fundamental side that uh, there are really a lot of interesting things uh, out of nanophotonics that you can do uh, to control thermal radiation. And in fact, uh, almost every new concept in nanophotonics from photonic crystal to metamaterial to plasmonics to maybe parity time symmetry, uh, anything that you can think of in nanophotonics that uh, you can probably find a way to apply uh, to control thermal radiation. So there are still a lot of papers to be written. Um, one of the, uh, of course, obvious point uh, is that to control thermal radiation, uh, you don't want lossless structure. So in nanophotonics, people uh, complain endlessly about uh, plasmonics being lossy. Um, uh, now, uh, this is a case where, uh, in fact, uh, loss is great. Uh, what you want, rather, is the capability to control and to engineer the loss uh, in the way uh, that you would like to do. And uh, now, um, many of the examples that I show uh, are still far from commercial. I think the closest we've gotten uh, is a field test that we're trying to do air conditioning system. The point here is that energy application needs large scale. Uh, a single wafer is not going to cut it. You need kilometers square. So uh, you need large scale fabrication. Uh, and also, uh, the photonics alone is not sufficient. You need to integrate 
the design and to consider those designs directly with the existing thermal systems. So there is actually a very, uh, it require a wide range of expertise if you actually want to see the commercialization of some of these things. Uh, on the other hand, on the fundamental side, uh, and uh, I think there's really still a lot to be learned uh, at this interface between thermodynamics and photonics. And I think uh, the photonic concept really can deepen uh, our understanding of some of the fundamental aspects of thermodynamics. So with that, uh, maybe let me uh, draw your attention to uh, my lecture note as well as a more extensive review on uh, this uh, topic. And uh, thank you for your attention.